winding down. This has been a, a, a rather long series, yes? I, I didn't notice this, and, and you may have already mentioned it, but, but Bill Jewell, who's on the uh, prayer list, uh -huh. he passed, I believe. He did. Linda, Linda Henley's cousin. Henley's cousin. I don't oh, think okay. No, I had not. I think he passed. He did. I was just curious. Okay. I'm glad. I appreciate you telling me that. So you see Bill Jewell, Linda Henley's cousin, was in a motorcycle accident. Passed away. Thank you for letting us know that. Like, was that just within the last it, yeah. couple of days? It's been recent, yeah. Okay. All right. I would appreciate your prayers for me tomorrow. I'm doing a graveside service um, at Grandview Cemetery with a with a a family. I went six kids, and I went to school with one of them, and. Uh, there's just not a, a lot of spiritual connection there. And uh, very, it's a very sad situation. <clears throat> but um, I would appreciate your prayers tomorrow about 11 o'clock. I'm going to be having that and uh, just praying for the right words. Uh, that, that, that those are the toughest by far. When, when you don't know that there's real genuine hope. So I appreciate that. Last week, uh, we began to look, what does Jesus have to say about life after death? And, and uh, toward the end of our time, we, we were talking about the fact that even, even for the disciples at the time of the resurrection, it, it just wasn't. It wasn't in their expectations. It wasn't in their mindset. And we gave a couple of examples of that. Mary Magdalene in John 20, verse 2, when she went to the tomb and, and didn't find Jesus, and uh, she went back to the disciples. They'd taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. Resurrection was not on her in her thought processes. You know, she was thinking that, that the authorities stole the body. Peter and John, after they heard that, they ran to the tomb to check it out. John 20, verses 8 and 9, saw the empty tomb. They believed that Mary was telling the truth. But the scripture says, and, and I find it interesting because it's John, who was one of the two that went to the tomb, said they still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. It just, I mean, who's going to think it? Who's going to... How do you, without seeing it firsthand, how do you even begin to, to prepare yourself to expect resurrection? Even though, even though different occasions he had tried to prepare, tried to teach. And of course, the, the, the most well-known would be Thomas, after Jesus had appeared to the other apostles. And Thomas, pretty much... Just flat out saying, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. And that's kind of where we left off last week. But confusion begins to clear up fairly quickly for the disciples when there's eyewitnesses. And just, just I'm just, we're not going to look at all these, I'm just going to list some of them. John tells us that Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene after that, that time when she was asking what happened to him. Matthew tells us that there were other women with Mary at that point in time. Joanna, Mary the mother of, of James, and some others. John also tells us that Jesus appears to the disciples. Do you remember where he appeared to the disciples? Yeah, they were locked away. Why? Because they were afraid. They were fearful. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't looking for it. And all of a sudden, Jesus stands in their presence. John also tells us Jesus appeared to Thomas. And that's a week later. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, we're, we're told that, that Jesus appeared to Peter, either the morning or the afternoon of the resurrection. Luke tells us that Jesus appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus. And in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 3 through 8, Paul tells us 
that Jesus appeared to 500 people in one gathering, uh, probably in Galilee. Now, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians 15 for just a minute, we touched on this last week, kind of at the very beginning of our time, but, but since we're bringing it up right here, I want to mention it again. If you look at verses, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, it's whether you want to refer to it as a creedal statement or, or you refer to it as, as doctrinal teaching of the early church, this, is, this may be among the very earliest. Um, because Paul writes, and he says, verse 3, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he goes through a list of, of those that, that uh, Jesus appeared to, which isn't a complete list by any means when you read the Gospels. But the thing that strikes me every time I go by this passage, it, this was written about A.D. 55. And Paul's basically saying, this is what I was taught when I first came to Christ. This is the instruction I received. And that would have been in the neighborhood of five years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So this, this, is, this is teaching that has been going on for 20, 25 years. Uh, AD 55 would be about 25 years, and it, and it hit me really clearly last week of, of just how sharp our memories are of important events 25 years ago. Uh, 25 years ago was when I came here to the church. I remember almost all the details of that, every step of the way. Now, the interesting thing is, I remember the details from my perspective. Debbie remembers the details from her perspective. Tim and Larry, and was there anybody else here? You were on the search committee. You remember the details from your perspective. But the thing is, important events in our lives, you you can think of important events in your life 20, 25 years ago, and you could tell everything about it. And that, to me, just, just gives me such a strong encouragement and faith in the Scriptures, and the teaching of the Scriptures, and the reliability of the Scriptures. Um, any thoughts? about that or, or anything so far? I think Paul had a strong vision for the future by putting it down in writing. Um, being that far removed, just 20, 25 years, mm -hmm. and he's um, speaking to several that are probably uh, were first-hand um, testimonies which is really, really important to us today. I love verse 6 when he says, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, and he makes the point, most of whom are still living. Kind of like, don't take my word for it. Find these folks. Talk with them. Um, well, we pointed out last week and, and, and continue to emphasize the resurrection Everything about the Christian faith hinges on that. If, if the resurrection didn't happen, um, well, and later on in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul would make that point. Then we're, we're spinning our wheels and wasting our time uh, about that. So, let's, let's really go back and, and see what Jesus actually says about it, you know, beyond the fact that he rose from the dead. What's he say about life? after death. Um, John 3.16, right? Probably one of the, may, maybe the first verse you ever learned in, in vacation Bible school or in Sunday school as a child growing up. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him 
will not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave. If you were to explain what Jesus, what, what, what John 3.16 means when it says God gave, how would you explain that? How would you describe what, what took place as God gave? It's the gospel story, isn't it? He took our sins away. And of course, it's the whole story of how did he do that, right? It's the gospel. It, it's, he sent his son. And you go from Philippians 2. He emptied himself. Took on our, our nature. Took on our form. Came a servant to the point of dying for us. It's, it's the gospel. That, that word gave, we could we could kind of just jump right by it because it sounds like it is, here's a gift, but it was, for that gift to be given, a lot took place for that to happen. His atoning death on the cross, and of course the physical resurrection. That whoever believes in him, if, if a friend of yours you were talking with, who was showing interest in the Christian faith, but had not become a Christian yet, and you're sharing John 3.16 with them. That whoever believes in him. And they ask you the question, well, what does it mean to believe? How would you answer that? You guys are quiet tonight. I've never had you this quiet in quite a while. You ask hard questions. Oh, that's, that's, not, that's not a hard one. Come on. I kind of give it some thought, though. <laughs> well, we, well uh, let me ask you this. Is, is, is the word believe when it comes to scriptural teaching different than what we typically think of it in just everyday conversation belief? Yeah, I think, I think it is. I think it's more filling it in here more than just up here. I mean, you can know something up here. But when you really feel it in your heart and believe it in your heart, to me, that's, that's totally different. It, and it's actually a combination of those things. It's, yeah. it's intellectually understanding and then, and then the idea of accepting and embracing. I mean, what, what, what you're being asked to believe is pretty outrageous mm -hmm. when you think about it. It's an absolute belief. Totally. Absolute Because you're being asked to believe that God sent, sent his son. That God himself in the flesh was in our midst. That he lived a holy, sinless life. That he died for your sins on the cross. Remember the cross is a stumbling block and foolishness. Stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to the Gentiles. And that he physically rose from the grave. That's, that's asking a lot. And that he ascended to heaven and, and, and he's at the right hand of the Father now as our, as our intercessor, our mediator. That's, that's where you're counting on a person who is seeking and searching to be open to the truth because that's when the Holy Spirit is going to do the work that brings someone to the Lord. Is that what you were going to comment? You have to have the Holy Spirit Oh, absolutely. To go thoroughly. Because I've heard people say, well, I believe in the devil. And I was like, well, you, do you believe in the devil? Well, I believe, you know. The I reality believe, of it. You know, believing in something is trusting with all your heart that it is true and putting your faith into it as well. Yeah. So it's making a decision that this is the way I'll go and I'm not backing off. Biblical belief is, is knowledge trust and action it's you live what you believe when you think of biblical belief that's that's where it's much deeper and broader than the general term believe uh, that that we use you know i believe the cleveland browns have a chance to win the super bowl this year 
Some people think I'm pure nuts when I say that. But that's different from saying I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he is the son of God, the Messiah. There's no doubt in my mind about that. The amazing man. <laughs> Boy, that's going way back, Steve. That's way back there. Well, well the, no, the, I, yeah, I know what you're saying. What you were saying, it, it, the difference in the word believe, like when when someone asks me that, or if I was that, I'm like, you embrace the Lord Jesus yeah. with your heart and with your soul. But yeah. It, it, and, and without, and you'll have doubt, and you'll be attacked. Sure. You know, and I, I was talking with my son. I said, I come to the realization that the reason that we're spiritually attacked, and I was thinking, you know, what do I matter? I mean, you know, but he and I were talking as when this alien stuff came up. I was like, um, <coughs> man and women, mankind, are, is the only living thing knowledgeable. To be threefold, even we, angels we, aren't three. We are, we are the top of His creation. Absolutely, we're made in His image. And don't you think that the enemy is going to hate every one of us? Well, he's wanting to destroy us. Well, because um, as a lion, well, he wants to do that. But you know, if if we look at this, we God gave, we believe, and the end result of that is we shall not perish, but have eternal life. Paul calls us and and he's, he's talking about that. Now, that's, that's in a conversation coming out with, Nic with Nicodemus, who's seeking and searching. Um, John 6, 47. John 6, 47. And, and this is in the midst of Jesus talking about himself as the bread of life, proclaiming himself as the bread of life, which followed up the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And in the midst of that conversation, Jesus says to the crowd, I tell you the truth, truth, he who believes has everlasting life. We've already talked about biblical belief. And this is another time, has everlasting life. Eternal life, everlasting life. That takes us beyond this life, doesn't it? Matthew 25, verse 46. Matthew 25, verse 46. This is at the end of the parable of the sheep and the goats. Okay? After the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus says, Then they, speaking of the goats, will go away to eternal punishment. But the righteous, the sheep, to eternal life. So, the... the, the <laughs> If we want to go, if we want to look at what Jesus is saying, and there's more places than this we can look at, he's talking about eternal life, existence that goes both ways. That there's eternal existence beyond uh, just the, the one, beyond the follower of Christ. And then if you go to John 10, and the background here is the Good Shepherd. In John 10, verses 27 and 28, Jesus saying, I'm, I'm the Good Shepherd. And later on in verses 27 and 28, he says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. There's, there's several things there. Now, we're, we're focusing on what he's saying about life after death. But it struck me as I was looking to, to this verse that says, My sheep listen to my voice. And I think about the Heavenly Father uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration saying to Peter, James, and John, This is my son whom I love, with him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. And Jesus is saying, my sheep, listen to my voice. It's distinctive. 
we recognize it. We recognize it in the scriptures. We recognize it in worship. We recognize it in prayer. We recognize it as we're tuned into him. So my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And see, these words just keep connecting in my brain. When he says, my sheep know me and follow me, do you remember what he said earlier when he talked about, if you're going to come after me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And to follow him, that was before he gave his life on the cross. That was before the ultimate sacrifice. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. I hear a real note of security here. No one can snatch them out of my hand. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> if, you, if you look at the whole context of that, he's talking about the Father holding us in his hand and, and Jesus is saying, I'm holding them in my hand and that image of the Father and the Son holding us. And no one can snatch them. No one can reach in and yank them out of my grip. Um, now, you know, there, there's clearly scriptures you can turn to and you and the, the uh, certainly the argument that that well can we not remove ourselves? From that grip, and it kind of, kind of comes down to. It's it's a challenging it's a challenging argument that that is for another day, but there are scriptures you can look at, and I think there are explanations for those scriptures. But uh, that is that is the other side of the coin, the other thought process. One thing, sometimes you run across experiences that, that, that help give insight. At least, I, I think they do. And if, if you don't mind me sharing this, you know, in that 10-year dark journey that, that my youngest was on, I baptized him before that. And of my three kids, I, I thought, He's got a better handle on it than the other two when I baptized him. And yet, when he was going through that long period of time, he was denying that he ever knew God. And I'm like, I'm talking to the Lord like, okay, what, what's the story here? And... Uh, I can't say that I got a clear answer at that point. But what I found fascinating and which brought clarity to me later is that, and by the way, you know what my least favorite verse in the Bible was at that point in time? Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. I didn't want anybody to tell me that. Because I, I'm watching this. And... Uh, but after he came back and turned life, life turned around and he recommitted his life to the Lord, we've had conversations and, and many of them. And the one thing that strikes me in this regard is that he said, I knew all along what the truth was. That never left me. I knew what the truth was. I just knew. I was so far removed from where I was supposed to be and where God wanted me. And truly, at that point, to be honest with you, he felt hopeless in ever getting back. And, and I, I think that this, and at least in his experience, and this is just one experience, God had him. And nothing was going to yank him out. I couldn't even tell him. But I thought it was fascinating afterward that that's where, that's where, that's where he was all along. 
from his own testimony and perspective. So that's been very helpful for me in just grasping this idea of security. And then you ultimately also get into the question of, well, did a person, ever, and that was my question at the time, did he ever know you? Did I miss it? So, I didn't really mean to go all the way down that road, but, but, but when you read about Jesus saying, no one can snatch them out of my hand, it kind of naturally brings that, that concept up. Any thoughts? Any any observations as you look at the scriptures and as you look at your life? Do you believe the once saved always saved? <clears throat> it's kind of what we're talking about. Do you believe once if you put your hand to the plow or look back, you're not worthy? Well, if I did, then what you're saying is no, but what I'm, I'm just saying what what would be what would be said there, and maybe that maybe you just help me clarify something for me, because the question then becomes: If my son had died of an overdose halfway through that time, was he lost? Now it depends on what end of the spectrum you're looking at it from. When I hear what he has said, I would say no, he was. In, in the Lord's hands securely and he wasn't going to let go of it. Even if life was out of control. Now, I don't know if that, you know, I don't know if, if what always comes to me is I'll never be, leave you or forsake you. Right, right. And when I feel like dejected and feel kind of a hammer. But I, but I think we need hammer. to keep in mind I'll never forget the, the student that came into my office when I was at Marshall a um, Marshall student came in and, and he was in tears because he, he, he was from the other end of the spectrum which was believing that he could lose his salvation at any moment. Mm -hmm. Like if he made a bad decision and, and, and was and died in an accident and he, he had an unforgiven sin and, and was separated from the Lord. That was it. And that's the other end of the spectrum. Um, and clearly that's not the teaching of Scripture. But when you when you come over here, this is the I think this is the thing that probably drives pastors crazy, and and parents of, of folk, kids they raised up, is that Baptists can believe, and not just Baptists, but anybody believes in eternal security, and and man, we can work that to our good, big time, quote unquote good, in the sense that we can we can live, we think we can just live like we want to live and God's going to forgive us and yeah we were saved we were baptized with no accountability and yet time and again in scripture you see there's an accountability so it's it's fascinating you know which comes full circle comes right back to biblical belief biblical belief is going to demonstrate itself in, in how we live. That's that's the core of what we believe. Obviously, we can get sidetracked. We can take our eyes off, right? Peter and the waves. All right? Any other thoughts? I think us as individuals somewhat human nature to judge or um, make assumptions or try to think that we know it's yeah. not for us to, to know it's for us to show that love of Christ regardless because that's a very personal decision yeah. Um, yeah. you know the church, the pastors youth leaders can do all they can to get people to come to Christ parents, parents uh, but it's still It's got to be, it's got to be each person's decision to follow that. Yeah. You can't make it happen. Well, you can, but but it's not real. 
but we gotta we gotta approach those that may be struggling and and all everybody with that love of Christ. Yeah, I've told you guys this before, and I and again I this was not intended to even. I, I never want to wear you out on it, but uh, this church was absolutely. You handled that situation perfectly. I mean perfectly. Um, and what I mean by that is when 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 he would come in to, to church, Josiah would come into church during that time, you guys did not. You didn't go up there, you know, preaching to him and lecturing him and telling him what he needed to be doing. <clears throat> you just went up to him. And this is his own words. He said, went up to him and told him you, you, it was great to see him, you loved him, and you're praying for him. <clears throat> and wow, that that's the that's how you do it. You know? Um, so what you're saying is 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 yeah, that's 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 how we do it. And uh, but Joel, I appreciate what you told what you told this group because how many people are listening that may be going through the same thing in your situation and in the young person's situation. Yeah. But they may be having those same questions. The parents may be having those same questions. So what you have said is giving people hope yeah. and helping them to understand a little better. I appreciate that. One one of the things one of the one of the temptations when you go through all this is you you talk about it too much. If I ever talk about it too much, just say, all right, son, I've heard this before. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, but to those of us that have walked that <laughs> walk, when they talk that talk, uh, uh, when you've been there and done that, you know, not necessarily turning away from God, but living a unhealthy lifestyle for a period of time. He didn't turn away. You're echoing exactly what, yeah. What, I mean, what we're you saying. know, even though I was doing bad things, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I still believed, right. the, you know, in the truth. Yeah, you knew what was true. And it, and like you said, eventually it circles back, like Jim Saki. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Well, <laughs> but uh, it, but it's, but it's, here here's the but, thing, Steve, and this is why I hesitate in, in even talking. I hesitate because I was fortunate in that I didn't lose my son. And I know too many that have lost their kids to drugs, to alcohol. Karen Holmes right now, her son's in ICU because of alcoholism. I mean, so that's why I hesitate because I, you'll never hear me say, I guarantee you, your child's coming back. You'll never hear me say that because to this day, I believe he could have died many times. And um, I don't know why he was spared. And to this day, I don't. I mean, I, I have my ideas, but that was a God thing. And, and uh, you know, um, that's that's why even when we when we... And this is this is awful, I guess. That's why even when we share praises, like when somebody beats cancer or somebody comes out of a, a car wreck unscathed, but there were three other people that died in the car wreck, or or you know, I think I think we have to be extremely aware of what we're saying and and how that comes across because for every cancer survivor, there's so many more that don't survive. And I can think of many in this church that we pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray for who didn't survive. So we have to be, in, in all things, we have to be, be just be cautious about what we're saying. And yet God is to be glorified, you know. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine line that, that we walk. And I think with a, it, the key is the awareness of one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and those that are, that are, uh, seeking uh, and may not know him yet. Well, let, let me 
uh, let, let's do this because I, we got to get this first. These couple of verses here, John 11, 25 and 26. Outside of the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. There. He's saying two different things there. I don't mean contradictory, but <clears throat> is he saying two different things or is he just repeating himself for emphasis? That's a good question. Um, he who believes in me will live even though he dies. <clears throat> for, for Without a doubt, I hear him in the last statement saying, yes, this physical body may die, but we are not going to die. Uh, the, 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 the first statement after I'm the resurrection of life, he who believes in me will live even though he dies. How, how else do we have that translated? I'm just curious. <clears throat> I'd I like to hear that. This is NIV, like 1980s. What's, what's the site? English standard. It's 11, John 11, 25 and 26. English standard. English standard has, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Okay. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Yeah. That translation almost sounds like the first part of it's referring to the resurrection at the end. And, uh, and then the second one is, is speaking of the fact that Yes, the body dies, but the spirit lives on in, in whatever whatever form that, that takes. So you're saying the first part is talking about the resurrection? The first part, well, as, as that's translated, okay. is sounds to me like, and you may y'all may hear something different there. Sounds to me like he's he's saying, Yes, we're gonna die, but because we believe in him, we're gonna be raised again talking about his death whoever believes in me though he die yet shall he live he's talking about how state should he be talking about his death whoever I hear him talking about others because of, because he's the resurrection and the life Joel can he be talking about the ones that have died before he has a, if, they, if they believe in him when the time comes that when he went and spoke to the dead while he was my, my take on it would be as I'm hearing him that's not the that's not the intended audience but they would certainly be included because obviously uh, I mean they get the chance to say right, yes right. I believe right. and they're, they're going to live then right. they see the fulfillment of, of their belief yeah. in him Mine says it maybe a, a little bit different. It's what's your What's your translation? It's God's word to the nations is what it's called. It, it is a translation. It's not a paraphrase or anything. But it says, I am the one who brings people back to life, and I am life itself. Those who believe in me will live even if they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? Is that a, is that a one-person translation? No, it's a, a team. A team. I'm not even familiar with that. What was the verse number again? John 11, 25 and 26. Uh, God's word to the nations. What do you think, Larry? I, you know, I, it, it seems to me, in, in, in trans, all the translations we've read, it seems to me so. that it's nuanced. It seems to me like he's saying two related but different things. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's just adding words on it. Yeah, uh, to emphasize it's, something. It's, it's kind of mysterious. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I guess we lose something in translation. I guess, you know, if we understood uh, whatever language he spoke in, Aramaic or whatever else, it might be clearer. But it does seem to me like he's saying two kind of different things. Two, you know, it's not, it's not just, he's not just repeating himself. He's saying, no, it a no, I, I don't think he saying is something a little different. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. Yes, sir. He told Nicodemus he must be 
must be born again mm -hmm. of water and the spirit. Maybe he's talking about two different births here just as well. And that, that helps me when I read this. Two different, he might be referring to two different births, like our first birth from the womb. You die, but then you're going to live, and that's another birth. Okay. I'm sorry, is that I, the Apostles of the what book? John, the book of John, Gospel of John, fourth, fourth book of the New Testament. Okay. Gospel of John 11, 25 and 26. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to say he is saying two different things. I've kind of always kind of felt that. I don't think the second statement is just let me emphasize what I just said. The, 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 the first is I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised. The second is I'm going to die, but I'm never going to die. Now, let, let me... If you want to, we'll be doing something different next week, but if you want to ponder that and come back with some questions, and if you want to throw me some questions, we can talk about it next week. But here, these aren't the words of Jesus. These are the words of Paul, who studied hard the words of Jesus and, and, and came up with his teaching. In Philippians 1, and we'll kind of wrap with this because it's, it's time, in Philippians 1, verse 21, he says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is Christ, we get that. To die is gain, that's a toughie. Because the question then becomes, how, how can death be gain? And so he's writing this as a prisoner. And he's been a prisoner for a long time, probably at least three years. Well, he, he explains himself. He says in verse 22 of Philippians 1, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. That's a good thing, to live as Christ. Yet what shall I choose? In other words, if it were up to me, and I were to go to be released from prison and go on living in the body, or if I were to die and be with the Lord, what would I choose? Have you ever thought that way before? <clears throat> yeah? You know, Compare that to what he says about, is it Epaphras? Dr. Weaver used to call him Epaphras. Uh, and he talks about, you know, he almost died and was such a blessing to me that he didn't. Right. So he's not cheering Epa Epaphras oh, no. to die. Let's go. No. Die. That'd be great. And, and I think he explains that right here. Okay. He, he goes on and he says, uh, if I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire, as a prisoner, three years, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you, speaking of the Philippian church, that I remain in the body. And he goes on, says, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all, uh, with all, of, your, with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. What I hear him saying there is, man, if I could just cut it right now and be with the Lord, I would do it in a heartbeat. I mean, how? It's kind of like he's saying, how can it get any better than that? But he's also, he deeply appreciates his call. He, he. Uh, it's like taking the victory he, before, the, before, the, before the work is done. Yeah, and you, and you know, I'm sitting here. As I'm thinking this thing, I'm thinking, none of us have been in that dang old situation. None of us have found ourselves in prison for three years because of our faith. And, and we tend to really enjoy life. We tend to look forward to all that we do. And so, matter of fact, at funerals, I'll often make the comment, because I'll be reading in 2 Corinthians 5, and it says, Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. And I, and I make the comment, most of us have never experienced that. Most of us have never been in that point where we're groaning along with be with our heavenly, in our heavenly dwelling. Which, by the way, don't all these things speak of death there? Death, I'm in the presence of the Lord. Uh, but, when, but when you're taking your last gasping breath because your body's about gone, 
whether it's heart disease or cancer or whatever it is, you are groaning, longing to be clothed with your heavenly dwelling. And I've seen so many people in that situation. So, yeah, I, I think in the heart of it all, life is a gift and we're to embrace it and use it and go for it with everything we've got. And at, the, and at the end of the line or wherever we are to know that this isn't all there is and it's going to be a whole lot better. I mean, how, well, how cool is that? You know, that... Um, you know, I mean, what you just said there, I think, you know, the first part of it, you, you can look at what, what Christ and what the apostles did. Uh, you know, what were their signs? Well, their signs were always healing. Their signs were always returning to health, yeah. returning to life. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, you know, it wasn't, oh boy, you're about to die. Go <laughs> That's it was, right. <laughs> right, right, right. Right. Heal. right. And he never turned anybody away. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Pastor Allen's going to be frustrated with me if I don't let you guys go to the choir. So, uh, uh, if you have any questions about anything we've talked about and you want to pick up and continue with, I mean, not that we're going to spend a whole time on it next week, but if you have some other thoughts and questions, just email me or, or put them on the uh, Facebook attendees page or text me or whatever, and, I'll, and we'll, we'll talk about it, and then we'll move on to something else. Okay? Let's close in prayer. God, we thank you uh, for what your son, not just by what he taught, but by his very life, his very sacrifice and death and resurrection, what he promised about eternal life, life after death. And I think about, it seems like always, we're in a situation as a church family where we're experiencing that, that reality. And uh, we thank you for, for all that that means to us. And God, so... Maybe as we leave this place, may you help us to embrace all that, that life offers because it is your gift to us. And may we also be able to do that even better because of the promise we have that this isn't all there is. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys got a little lively toward the end. Way to go. <laughs>